Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking with Javier Blas and Jack Farchi on their new book, The World for Sale, Money, Power and the Traders Who Barter the Earth's Resources. Javier, Jack, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. So we're going to talk about, obviously, the book, I think particularly focusing on the last commodity super cycle and, and then looking forward toward the next one, or at least the, uh, the supposed next one. Before we get there, the book has a real rich history on the, the pioneers, the start of, of, the, of the commodity trading world as we, as we now know it, particularly, I guess, around oil. It seems it was really kicked off with the I guess national or states taking back control of their of their natural resources and therefore affording the opportunity for commodity traders to start interacting with them and moving those products as well as I think you know one of the things you talk about in the uh, in the book is is almost is you call it capital arbitrage um, raising money in the industrial world, in the in the in the west and and, and put it to work in the emerging markets uh, which at the time wasn't even a term could you just give us a sample, a bit of an overview of that early stages, the 70s and the 80s in the commodity trading world? Well, it was certainly very different to, to today. I mean, communications were difficult uh, when we were interviewing some of the um, old hands of the business who are now in the 80s and 90s. It was very interesting to to hear the stories of how everything was done on telegrams and, and telexes. I mean, certainly not the telephone or, or, or the internet. And even traveling to, um, you know, Latin America or Africa or somewhere remote in China was very complicated in those days. So um, it, it was a slower pace trading. But as you say, um, things really started to to move along uh, with the with the 70s and when um, OPEC countries started to nationalize their um, oil fields taking away them from the Seven Sisters and along came the, the, the traders who became allies of those OPEC countries to sell their oil into the spot market. So all of a sudden the power moved away from the international oil companies, the likes of the forerunners of what is today ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, BP, and it went into these new outfits um, on the shores of Lake Geneva, maybe in Rotterdam, which were all of a sudden buying and selling huge amounts of um, of crude oil um, and that was the the engine of of trading that's where the the profits of the companies uh, the, the trading houses started to increase significantly and we got the kind of the making of what um, became the, the 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 trading environment that has you know we have known since then that's when Mark Rich was was kind of born and and and, and grew up and from it came Glencore and Trafigura. That's also the time where Beetle started to grow and, and several other companies. And it was more or less around that same time in the 70s where the agricultural trading houses for a number of reasons, um, particularly because the, the Soviet Union ran out of food, um, they really were able to do big, big trades that became very profitable and also um, it started to grow in a, in a much accelerated pace. Mm. Jack, if you could talk to this, I mean, it was a very much a key feature was this lack of transparency, right? The, the, the fact that the price discovery was difficult, knowing who to talk to about actually accessing these commodities, who to sell it to. You know, the, this was a very tactile, um, a very closed society or group that were, would, would put together these trades. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think until probably at least the, the 1980s, if not, uh, pro- if not a little bit later than that, uh, simply knowing the price of the commodity was a really valuable piece of information. So we spoke to copper traders who told us about going to Peru in the 1980s and being able to buy copper at the price of last week or uh, Ian Taylor. Uh, who we interviewed in 2019 before he died, told us about buying uh, oil from from Esso in the UK, from Exxon, uh, at yesterday's price. And, you know, even a a huge company like Exxon uh, was so unsavvy about the market that it was willing to sell at yesterday's price. So, you know, whenever you're in a rising market, it's just free money for the trading house. 
uh, and clearly that's changed a lot uh, since then. But but you know a lot of the a lot of the the edge in those days was information, knowing knowing the price and and communications. You know, having access to a telephone line or a telex. And it struck me in this early stage, and actually it's it, I think it's brought home by the book how much sort of big structural changes were having an impact and providing these opportunities. So you you know you had OPEC, then you had the the Iran oil crisis, you know, the, the oil crisis of 73, you know, we had obviously the later on the end of the Cold War. I mean, these were, these were incredibly challenging times. This wasn't the era of global free trade. No, this is the era where, where free trade was advancing, but, but we were not nearly there. I mean, this is pre the big uh, liberalization that they came along with the WTO. But you, you are right that uh, perhaps the, the three big, um, geopolitical changes that benefited the traders are the first one is the the big uh, rise of OPEC and the petro states and how they 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 um, uh, rustle control of their uh, oil fields from the seven sisters the other big change that benefited the traders was the um the the fall of the soviet union and the integration of the communist bloc into into the global economy uh, particularly because we were talking about countries that they were uh, huge producers of natural resources, uh, Russia in oil, aluminium, wheat. And, and the third one is the rise of China. And along, along with the rise of China, the need for uh, the commodities of Africa. Um, that probably is the, the three big um, waves of geopolitical changes that really the, the traders surf that those waves and, and were able to make a lot of money uh, riding the, those of them. And that really took the industry from being um, a relatively small, uh, a relatively small industry with with relatively small uh, companies. You know, we, we, we kind of start the story of the book just after the Second World War. And at that point, um, you know, there's a kind of two two parts of the industry, the grain trading industry and the metal trading industry. And they're both um, relatively small companies at that stage. And then by the time you get to 1979, the second oil crisis, uh, Mark Rich is making a billion dollars of profit, which is, you know, for context, puts it among the 10 most profitable companies in America. And suddenly you have this industry that is actually not a bit part of the global economy, but a hugely central part of it. Yeah, I think you mentioned in the book that that's the equivalent of Apple's profits at the time, right? That's later on. That's later on. That's the profits of the profits that the the, the three largest traders, so so Vitol in oil, Glencore in metals, and Cargill in agriculture, made in the super cycle from, I think the time period we took was 2002 to 2011. Um, combine them, and that's more than Apple made over the same period, or more than Coca Cola made. Right. We're, we're, we're going to get there. There's a couple of more stages before we get to the current commodity super cycle, which is really. You know, you get from the book the story of the rise of China that really kicks and triggers and, and fuels that. The other thing that happens in the 1990s, and I love the description of the book of kind of, I think, you know, Andy Hall um, making some significant trades, but is the rise of, of paper, financial instruments coming to the commodities world. Can you just talk to that a little bit? The emergence of, of the futures market was a really big change for the oil traders. I mean, it was to me very interesting talking to the founder of VTOL and how they were trading in the 70s when there were not futures markets or swaps. Uh, and simply they were going home every evening with uh, betting almost the whole company into what they were doing because uh, they have no hedging whatsoever. Um, so then uh, in the 80s, we get the, the emergence of the WTI contract in New York, later the Brent contract in, in London. And you could trade futures, so the companies, uh, the oil traders, for the first time can hedge their contract. But with that, also it makes the speculation a lot more simple. Um, you could simply lo go long or short on the market, and companies start to do that. And it kind of uh, the oil market start to resemble a bit more of a, the, the likes of foreign foreign currency, a bit more like if you like the the, the casino, the casino market. Uh, but it also allows for the first time in, in, in the oil market more of the, the kind of the contango plays that we have already seen in metal. So we have the big, the big first contango plays that Andy Hall pioneered during the um, early 90s and around the, the, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, uh, where he made uh, an absolute killing um, and then lost a lot of the money on the way on the way down also. So, yeah, that 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 emergence of 
paper trading really changed oil trading because it really gave the, the oil traders both the ability to hedge and, and then take uh, of a lower risk on price exposure for the day to day of what they were doing of moving cargos. But they also made a lot simpler for the traders to use the information that they have about how the market was looking. And at that point, the traders still have a, a huge information advantage with their uh, with the respect of, of the rest of the market and use that information to uh, speculate on the paper market and, and make, in some cases, a lot of money, but in others lose uh, almost as much. So you've got this, there have been market developments. You've got a community there in the traders who are used to doing business in challenging locations, that kind of, again, that kind of capital arbitrage um, in the emerging markets. But to date, this has all been you know, a lot of Latin America, um, the former Soviet Union. Um, then, and I think it's, it's it, we have this, you know, you, you've had the 90s, late 90s, kind of commodities gets hollowed out um, again, and it's a pretty rough time, right? Is, is, that, is that fair? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, I think that was a, a key a key moment in terms of preparing the way for what was to come next in the 2000s and the super cycle and the profitability of, of that period for the traders was that in the 90s, you had the, the commodities industry really being hollowed out, both in terms of the trading houses, but also uh, also the producers. You know, you had extremely low prices, um, uh, both for oil and metals. Uh, and uh, and so you had uh, huge consolidation in big oil uh, and that had some really meaningful implications for trading. So the ExxonMobil merger, for example, Mobil was one of the big trading uh, was one of the big traders among oil companies. Uh, and then after the ExxonMobil merger, ExxonMobil stopped being a big trader. Um, and again, uh, the merger of uh, Total, uh, Fina and Elf, all three were big traders and then they became one. Still a big trader, but suddenly a lot less competition in the market. Uh, and at the same time, among the trading houses, there was also consolidation and, you know, companies in, in a period of low prices. Uh, you know, I think one of the one of the things that we trace in the book is that traders tend to make most of them the most money when when prices are, uh, are going up and when there's volatility on the upside. Uh, and so in that period of, of low prices, um, there were also a lot of um, traders that went out of business. I mean, and, and probably the most important example of all, which had sucked up a lot of the talent and, and, and probably a lot of the, the business in, uh, in commodity trading over the previous few years was Enron. And so in that period of the 1990s, you lose an awful lot of the big trading companies. And what you're left with is the companies that are the shape of the industry today, you know, the ones who survived, Vitol, Glencore, Trafigura, in agriculture, Cargill, uh, ADM, Bungie, Louis Dreyfus. Uh, it's very much the same shape of the industry that we see today uh, was, was the people who emerged, you know, end of the 1990s, early 2000s. Mm. And it has a lot of analogies with what's kind of the last couple of years as well, right? And I guess we'll come on to that. You know, we were at the back end of the previous super cycle, uh, now potentially facing a new one. And instead of it being China, the argument is it's energy transition. But I, I want to zoom in on that moment. So there's a, a very, you know, arresting moment in the book. And I think you center on Mick Davis and Extrata. Basically, you know, Ivan Glazenberg, Mick Davis make this, this moonshot idea that China's coming online and they are going to need all the resources. You know, they're going to cause a huge um, rise in commodity prices, and they go long uh, coal mines in, in that particular instance. Um, can you can you talk to that? I mean, actually, it's an interesting it's an interesting story because I'm not sure that the genesis of that bet was to do with China. Uh, you know, the origin of that bet, uh, as we as we discuss and write about in the book, was Ivan Glassenberg in the 1990s. When coal prices were very low, particularly in 1998, the coal market was in a real was in a real funk, uh, and and he thought coal prices could only go up, not because he had this vision for China, but because they were below the cost of below the marginal cost of production. Producers were losing money. Prices can surely only go up. No futures market in coal. How do you go long coal? You have to buy mines, and so he started buying mines, lots of mines, and that's how Glencore found itself with all these coal mines. Uh, and then and then the extrata part of the story uh, is Glencore, again, you know, part of the story of the, the late 1990s, early 2000s, low commodity prices, 
commodities industry struggling, Extrata was uh, a bit of a wart uh, on the on the side of Glencore. It was a, a, a struggling uh, entity with a few different assets that had been acquired over the years, in which Glencore held, uh, you know, a, a, a large stake, but not a to- not 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 a hundred percent. Um, and they brought McDavis in to try and do something about it. Uh, Glencore needed money uh, at this point because uh, they needed to buy out uh, this investor that they brought in, that Willie Strotter had brought in when they did the buyout of Mark Rich. Um, and Glencore was trying, Ivan Glassenberg was trying to IPO the coal mines that he'd bought over the 1990s. And then September 11th happened and the IPO couldn't happen. And so McDavis who they just hired to run Extrata and go and go out and buy things, said, OK, why don't I buy the coal mines and put them in Extrata and do an IPO in London and raise capital? And that's how Extrata was born. Uh, and Mick Davis, and we were bought in the book, uh, wrote this memo around that time, I think it's July 2001, uh, to his team in Extrata when he just, he'd just been hired by, by Ivan Glassenberg and Willie Strotter to lead Extrata, saying China's going to be big. And this is the opportunity we need to seize on. We need to go out and buy assets because China is going to transform uh, the market. Uh, And that's indeed what he did. He started off with Glencore's coal mines, uh, but then he moved on. He bought Mount Isa in Australia, big copper miner. uh, and, and, And he told us that the advantage that he had was not that he was super bullish prices, but simply that where other people had their expectation for forward prices coming down very sharply from from whatever price they were at the moment, even as the, the super cycle was just beginning and prices were beginning to to come up for for copper and other metals. Uh, the Mick Davis and his Extrata team just put in a slightly a slightly slower uh, decline in the forward curve, and so they were able to pay much higher prices than than anyone else in the mining industry, even higher prices than some people in Glencore were, were comfortable with. But uh, they went ahead and did it anyway, and and, and it turned out to be very smart deals. Interesting. And then and then we're off to the races, right? I think you've already shared some of the scale here. You talk about, I think in the book, there's Cargill's numbers of, you know, 500 billion EBIT in, uh, or profit actually in 2003-04, but rising to 4 billion at the top. But we're really, I mean, Javier, can you just give us some sense of this, you know, I guess not only the scale of the commodity trading boom in the 2000s, um, you know, in, in, in the, the super cycle, but also kind of, can you talk a little bit about how they were doing it and perhaps how that was different to the previous boom in the 70s and, and so on? Well, I think that the, the biggest difference um, between the 70s and, and the boom of the 2000s is that the companies that they are riding the boom of the 2000s are truly global. Um, they, they have a, a business that encompasses any geography of the planet and in some cases, they may be doing only agriculture, but they are more or less on every commodity within the agricultural market. If they are in oil, they are on every energy commodity that you will mine. Um, I think that that is, that is the, the big difference. The other difference in the 2000s is that uh, as, as they are benefiting from the, from the increase in, 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 um, in trade and in profits, they start to reinvest a lot of the profits into assets. And it's when we see really the traders going um, a, a lot uh, more capital intensive and investing in, in initially uh, assets that they are needed for trading, whether it's just warehouses or ports or export terminals and things like that. And then moving into more of a production assets, whether it's um, Cargill investing in, in beef um, slaughter uh, plants, um, Cargill, uh, sorry, uh, Beetle going into uh, petrol stations or, or, or obviously Glencore going into mines. And in terms of the profitability, I, I'm just going to give you two numbers. In 1998, Beetle, the world's largest oil trader, made $24 million. That's $24 million. In 2009, Beetle may two point almost three billion dollars. As that's the we, we went in the space of, of little more than a decade from twenty four million to two point three billion. Uh, and that's how much the, the industry changed on just you know ten, twelve years. I wanna dig a little bit further into that kind of trans transformation from trading to just 
into the asset space because that's a real watershed moment that you highlight in the book. Before we get there, just staying kind of, and you know, when my career was starting in in searching commodities, the, the sort of mid two thousands, you also had, you know, it wasn't just those the trading houses, right? You had you had the banks starting effectively trying to replicate trading houses with it. You had a lot of other participants trying to get into the space. I, I know it's not a focus of the book. Could you just talk to that for a little bit, though? Yeah, I mean, you are absolutely right. At the same time that, that the traders were expanding and starting to ride the, the, the boom in, in commodity trading in the 2000s, the, the banks were doing a bit of something similar. Um, and they were, if, if the traders have moved from, from physical into also trade quite a lot of paper, the banks were, were doing the, the opposite. They were moving from paper into trading physical. So that's also the years where... Um, uh, Morgan Stanley became a massive physical presence in the in the oil market, particularly in gasoline, where um, Goldman Sachs was investing in coal mines in in Colombia. Um, so so we got the banks very very active, and and because the prices moved so much during that that period of the super cycle, uh, and hedging by everyone, whether producers or consumers, also went through the roof. And particularly in the early years of the super cycle, there was very little competition um, in Wall Street on, on commodities. It was, it was just Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. And then later they came others like Barclays and Deutsche Bahn and JP Morgan, Citigroup. But at the beginning, it was just a duopoly. It was the, the Wall Street refiners, uh, Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley. And the profits were just astonishing. Um, revenue on the banks was, was rising and it was measured in the billions of dollars in commodities. And that was a big, big change in the market. Yeah. And I think it's worthwhile noting there that I think, Jack, you, you, you raised it was this, you know, the talent was also hollowed out in the late 90s. Suddenly, along with that massive scale up in profitability was the demand for people. And I think it was really when the banks really started to get in in a big way, particularly in oil. That's when we started seeing those stupendous numbers going around as teams move from, uh, it was what was it, um, Merrill Lynch to Deutsche Bank uh, was a famous one, and just you know, m- tens of millions of dollars worth of sign-ons and, and guarantees and so forth. It really was kind of just a, you know, it's a, it was a crazy time. Well, I do remember when when I started writing about the commodity industry, which was 2010. Uh, Javier's a little longer in the tooth than I am, uh, and. And it was almost like a, a joke that everyone you'd meet had started their career at either Enron or Cargill. Those were the trading houses uh, for, for commodity trading. In every bank, uh, in almost every physical trading house, almost everyone had started their career in one of those two places. Um, and I guess that is a testament to the fact that there wasn't much you know, um, of a, of a uh, conveyor belt for, for young talent in that period, that down period of the kind of late 90s, early 2000s. And so, and so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a hot market. I think, Paul, we used to say that the, the hottest commodity market was for commodity traders. Yeah. Not commodity yes. headhunters. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a fun time. Um, you know, and I, and I, but I think actually there's a, and we're going to come on to it, right? The, when the music stopped, there was quite a few questions asked about actually how profitable some of these, especially on the banking side, uh, you know, actually was. But let me let me sort of see if I can encapsulate the thesis that you kind of put to us in the book, which is at some time at that peak of that commodity super cycle in the, the 2010, let's say 2011, you know, there was, a, there was just increasing tra- price transparency, which I think we learned from earlier in the book is really the key to these outsized profits. And, and a lot of competition. So basically these, and you've mentioned it already, but these trading houses and banks had to start investing in the commodity assets themselves to gain that that optionality they previously gotten through contracts and so on and and the and the flows that then had a couple of things firstly that meant that there needed to be access to they needed to get access to public markets or or long term capital as you put it which is expensive and also actually these things the actual assets themselves you know these aren't necessarily fantastic assets to own and run. They're, they're, a commodity asset itself is not a very lucrative thing. Um, and, that's, and, and also in that kind of race, that you point out in the book, in the race to find these assets, they're, they're going to worse and worse places to find and buy them, right? Whether that's 
the DRC or, or wherever. Um, and that starts to put a, a real crimp and challenge to the, the markets itself. Um, can you talk about that? And perhaps, you know, the most emblematic moment of this was the Glencore's IPO, which I think, uh, ironically, at the time when perhaps they were peaking, really raised the the profile and, and suddenly everyone realized, you know, not least their customers, how much money these these companies were making. I know there's a lot there to unpack, but can you can you talk about that shift from transparency issues to, to investing in assets and the, the, the consequence that had, have you? Yeah, uh, the move into needed to raise capital because they were moving into assets was very interesting because um, it really forced the industry for the very first time to to kind of come out of the shadows. Um, you're going to go as a public company, you need to release a big prospectus and you need to reveal a lot of your financial information. You are going to um, uh, raise a bond. You, you need to do something quite similar. And it was a time where all of a sudden the companies were for the first time revealing uh, their profitability, their p &L, their balance sheet, the bonus that the partners were getting. And what it sounds today quite normal to know how much a company like Trafigura makes every year and what is the, the bonus pool for the company. The first time that those numbers came out, it was it caused a shock. So there was a big big transparency uh, movement in, in that at that period. Um, and also, it's the first time, uh, and, uh, and that later became a bit of a problem for the industry, but it's the first time that the customers of the traders realized actually how much money the traders are making. Until that day, they knew that they were making money, and in some cases, they suspected they were making quite a lot of money. But when you put it uh, black and white and, and you know, uh, on several, uh, and the number is quite long, and, 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 and a customer realized that this company is making, you know, one billion, two billion, three billion, five billion dollars, the question comes like, well, if you are a fair counterparty to me, if you are making a market for me, how in hell are you making that much money? Um, and I think that um, customers, for, for, for the customers, it was a surprise how much money the traders were making. And, and I think that that later uh, created trouble for, for the industry. Just to jump in on that point, uh, we have a quote in the book uh, from, from David Isroff, who was the head of Ferro Alloys at Glencore until 2006. And, uh, and he was talking about, about the IPO and about exactly that tension. He said, you always had this tension with your customers. Well, if you're being a fair trader, how come you guys are making so much money out of everything? But until the IPO, people knew we were making money, he said, but nobody knew the extent. And that, that, was a, that was a big, big moment. And, and then, Paul, the, the other moment that you allude with was the challenge of running assets. I mean, most of these companies have never run assets. Most of these companies... Uh, the only asset that uh, most of these companies have run was their offices. That was that was as much. Uh, companies like uh, Vitro and Trafigura, for long, all the assets that they have were the offices that they have, the desks of the employees, and the computer system, and no no much than that. And they move into owning uh, mines overseas, terminals, petrol stations. That requires a completely new uh, skill set that most traders didn't have, and, and it took them a, a bit of time to, to, to get used to that. All of a sudden, the payroll of the traders expand massively, and then you you, you get massive companies with, with 50,000 employees or more. And I think that that was quite challenging at the beginning for, for the traders, probably more than going into difficult jurisdictions, because in general, the traders were already used to, to be in places like the DRC or Iraq or or um, Mongolia or similar. Uh, I think that the, the geographical challenge was uh, lower than actually the challenge of for the first time running assets uh, and for the first time not thinking that your um, your uh, credit lines are effectively one year loan of revolving facilities that you are repaying all the time so your debt actually is no longer than six weeks but all of a sudden raise money that is five years long, 10 years long, or even equity, which is, you know, in, in a way perpetual. Yeah. And that, like, I think starts to set up what what happened in kind of 2015 onwards, when you'd rate, you know, the, 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 the cash requirements of these companies was just so much higher. And they were, they, they were owning assets in 
okay, all over the world, but certainly in some difficult jurisdictions. Um, before we kind of get there and kind of perhaps the the the, the fall of the last commodity supercycle, there's a couple of points I want to dive into. One is. I asked about this a, a couple of times to different guests, but it seems like the global financial crisis didn't even cause a skip a beat when it came to the commodities world, right? It was, apart from, I think, removing some of the banks' participation, you know, actually it only empowered these, these you know, the, the trading houses were the beneficiaries of the uh, the global financial crisis. Yeah, I think that that's, that's right. I mean, certainly eliminated some, comp- some competition because some of the banks took a step back in part because they were forced by the, the Federal Reserve. So uh, the fact that Morgan Stanley in particular took a step back from the oil market and JP Morgan from metal markets, I think that it was quite important and beneficiary for the independent trading houses. Um, uh, Glencore has a, a difficult time, but because at that point it was already becoming more and more a producer, not just a marketer. And therefore, it was exposed more to the ups and downs of the flat price. But in general, the, the, the fallout of the global financial crisis was quite a good moment for some of the trading houses because they either saw it coming, like in the case of Cargill, which uh, we, we tell the story of how saw it coming and, and short the oil and freight market on the paper side and make a billion dollars out of that bet or because they were able to benefit from the contango plays and, uh, and make quite a lot of money in 2009 uh, use on contango carry trades. Uh, it was one of the best years ever for companies like Beetle. And actually, to jump in there, perhaps, Jack, you can talk to this. You, you do have a, a segment there where you're talking about the commodity traders themselves saying, I think Ricardo Lehman's quoted, the you know, it's these, these sort of elite prop trading, proprietary trading groups that sit in these trading houses that are really starting to drive profits based on just that kind of trade you just mentioned with Cargill, right, where they're able to take all of this information from their global footprint and start making these speculative bets, which are pretty informed. Yes, uh, I mean, that's right. I think it was, for us, it was quite an interesting experience because, you know, we've been covering these companies uh, for quite a long time. And one of the kind of constant, um, certainly external perceptions of the industry is, oh, they're just hedge funds. What, that's one of the common common views from people who don't know very much about the trading industry is, oh, they're just hedge funds betting, making bets on the market. And, you know, as we as journalists speak to these companies, they would consistently over many years tell us, no, 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 that's completely not true. We don't take any flat price risk. Um, you know, yes, we obviously have positions, but we're not, we're not speculating. We're just trading uh, physical commodities around the world. And that sometimes involves taking, uh, taking risk, but it's not, uh, it's not speculating. And then talking to people for this book, uh, and it, you know, yes, it's clearly true. Uh, it is a misperception to think of commodity traders as hedge funds. They're not hedge funds. They're not just punting on the markets. At least the vast majority of them are not just punting on the markets. But talking to people for the book, uh, it really came out to what extent punting on the markets and taking speculative positions, um, I mean, maybe punting is an unfair word for it, taking speculative positions based on their very good information and very good insights into what's going on in the global economy and, and the commodity markets, is a big part of, uh, of particularly the kind of excess profits that they were making in that super cycle. And I mean, you, the quote you mentioned from Ricardo Lehman, who, uh, as I guess many people will know, uh, was the CEO of Noble Group, but also worked at Louis Dreyfus, also worked at Engelhart, said, in all of the companies I've worked for, most of the money was made trading prop. So that gives you a sense of, yes, they are physical commodity traders, but they're also taking speculative positions. Which did trigger a lot of scrutiny at the time, right? When we had this global financial crisis, you had kind of the Arab Spring, you had this big run up in food prices. And there was, a, you know, a lot of sort of various investigations into how significant a, the fact that the spot market in commodity trading was unregulated had to do with um, these, these, the, the volatility in the price swings. And I, I guess the, the rough upshot of that was, you know, in the end, probably quite little in and of itself. Yeah, there, there was uh, there was quite a lot of political pressure because of, as, as you mentioned, prices were up. I mean, gasoline prices went through the roof and, 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 and drivers were not happy. So politicians were reacting. Uh, food prices rose significantly and to, to reach a point where it, it become a, a bit of a national security problem for a number of emerging countries, which saw riots. So there was a lot of uh, concern in, in, in emerging markets, but, but also in the Western world that um that you know speculation was a big problem it was in part mostly uh the financial side 
pension funds going into commodities and so on, but the trading houses for sure got also investigated and there were some cases in which um, you know, some small fines were applied because people were, were not following completely the rules. But I, I will I will agree with you that probably uh, no much came from that. And at the end of the day, the, the, the traders may have been speculating, but they were speculating based on the on the privileged information or, or the superior information that they were they were making. And at the end of the day, probably were making the market more efficient. But the prices were not uh, or at least not for a long time uh, ahead of, of what the fundamentals require. Mm. So we're right at a fever pitch. It's like 2013, 2014. The, there's been an asset buying spree. Everything's about commodities. You start at that point, I remember being in um, Lausanne for one of the FT conferences at the time. And, you know, it really was about the rise of national champions. You had, you know, Kofco being a, a great example, you know, BTG, others were setting up their own commodity trading business. In, in part of the um, sort of the vernacular was about securing food supply or securing, securing these strategic resources um, and the supply chains. It turns out that a lot of those organizations, I mean, they, they were buying at the very top, both in, in assets and in people. And very quickly, you know, prices started to fall and we had this just huge drop in, in the wallet in commodities. But can you just, uh, maybe Jack, just give us a couple of minutes on that, that kind of that, that frenzied peak and the, the, the new rise of the, these challenger trading houses that were going to take on the, the big four in ag and take on the oil traders and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, probably the Glencore IPO epitomizes it more than anything else. Ivan Vassenberg and his partners selling out in May 2011, uh, pretty much the, the peak of the market, both in terms of uh, commodity prices and also in terms of the profitability of the, of the commodity trading industry, which, I mean, is doubtless something that, that he himself recognized. I mean, one of the, one of the arguments that he made for, for, for buying coal mines and, and investing more in assets and becoming more of a miner was that he thought that the days of being a pure trader were, were numbered. Um, but actually, you have, this, uh, you have this situation, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, Kofco uh, coming in and, and, and trying to build and you know, succeeding with some fairly significant stumbles, uh, but succeeding uh, in building uh, a meaningful uh, player in agricultural trading. Um, Noble Group, another one that was growing very rapidly, uh, and and several of these uh, companies coming unstuck in in the down cycle. But actually, the the same companies that had been you know the survivors of the 1990s that had arrived in the early 2000s at the beginning of this boom cycle as the incumbents, Cargill, Beetle, Glencore, Trafigura, also were the ones who survived through this downturn uh, in 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 2000. And 13, 14 uh, to maybe 2019, let's say. Um, I think, you know, what, what clearly did change is that the profitability stopped growing. So, you know, you look at profits, the, the, at least those companies were still making, uh, were still making profits through that period, uh, most of the time. Uh, but it stopped growing. Uh, you didn't really return, uh, at least not on a whole industry basis to the kind of highs of 2007, 8, 9, uh, until probably 2020. Um, and, and particularly the return on equity started looking really bad because not only was profitability, was profits not growing or, or even going down somewhat, but also they'd invested a huge amount of money in assets. And so you had this very big equity base. And so the return suddenly looked much less attractive. Um, so where, you know, I mean, we, we were looking, for example, at the, at the profits of, of Mercuria, where we managed to get hold of all of the accounts of Mercuria uh, since its foundation. And, you know, in the first few years, in the kind of 2005, 6, 7, 8, the return on equity there was 30, 40 percent. By 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, it was more like 10, 11 percent. Um, and that's of a company that, you know, has survived and thrived uh, through that difficult period. There, there, there's a real reckoning, I guess, that happens from that sort of I don't know, 2014, really, until I, you would argue 2019. And it's that confluence of factors, right? So you, 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 as you mentioned, significant investment in assets that started becoming looking very shaky with, with declining prices. You already noted right at the outset that generally traders make more money when prices are going up um, than they are when they're going down. Um, and you've got, um, you know, you've, the, the whole other factors, a slew of other factors. 
what I think really br brings out in the book as well is that part of this transparency driving less profitability, but also driving the push into assets and driving into locations and types of deals that were increasingly risky from a, a geopolitical standpoint, you start to have the real reckoning when it comes to um, investigations, you know, tied particularly to, to the US and or the fact that all these, these um, contracts are US dollar denominated. Um, and that's a real, you know, that, and that starts to drive out the banks, reduce liquidity as a real reckoning happens. Can you, have you, can you just, as a really powerful moment in the book, can you talk to that? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I mean, commodities are traded traded in dollars, and that is the 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 route that the U.S. could use to clean up the industry. At one point, uh, I think that the U.S. Uh, starts to get a bit worried what's happening when when certain action of the traders may be impacting his own uh, diplomatic interests, and and the. The, the dollar is the route that they can use. I mean, they can't go to the banks and, and, and say uh, what these traders are doing. They're, they're using the, the, the dollar um, to trade, so that comes into our jurisdiction. And that's where we get the, the, the emergence of, of a number of investigations on the traders, which in a way are continuing today. I mean, you know, so that is a, a, the, the beginning of, of a moment where... Um, big sanctions from the American authorities are falling on the banks and some of those sanctions are related to uh, the services that the, the banks are providing to the commodity traders. And I think that the banks awake to the fact that they carry quite a lot of risk because of the transactions that they are clearing through through their their um, their offices in Geneva, but because those, um, those uh, transactions need to go through New York or, a, or an American bank because they are domino denominated in dollars. All of a sudden, those, those, uh, those transactions are, are the purview of the Department of the Treasury in the United States and therefore the Department of Justice. And, and I think that is that pressure from the American authorities goes into the banks and the banks put the pressure into the traders. And that is where we get... Um, the investigations and a bit of the cleaning up of the industry. It's also sort of just reflecting on that a moment. One of the reasons why it comes out in the book that Glencore IPO'd was that the key man risk, if they, if they lost any of their key shareholders, either just the senior traders in the organization, they'd have this double effect of reducing equity and in, increasing debt. That was part of the driver between behind them IPOing. It's kind of fascinating that none of the other houses have actually IPO'd. Um, since then, because there's a lot of down, you know, I know you mentioned the book Cargill furiously resisting ever going public um, because of just these kinds of, you know, the, the scrutiny you come under and Glencore's proof of that. Um, but there is this driver as well that these all these organizations are in, you know, aging, frankly, and the the owners, the, the traders themselves also want to create, create businesses that they can actually extract value from, you know, down the line. You know, not just on year, you know, cash, cash bonuses and stuff. So there's also there's there's that dynamic as well. Is that is that fair? Uh, yeah, I mean, we we report, for example, that that Vito uh, twice in its history considered very seriously uh, an IPO, uh, and in both cases, and well, I mean, I guess potentially a third time if you include the time that they considered being bought by Enron, um, which would have uh, made them public by by default as part of Enron. Uh, but also in the 1980s, they considered an IPO, and also again in the 2000s, they considered an IPO. And on all, all occasions, they decided not to go ahead with that. I mean, I think the Glencore situation is slightly special in two ways. One, because they had this rather badly designed uh, structure of their of their um, shareholder uh, payout, whereby immediately on the day that somebody left the company, their equity turned into a debt that the company had to pay them out over five years. So when somebody who's a big shareholder resigns, not only do you lose their equity from the equity side of the balance sheet, but you also increase the debt, um, which puts you in a bind. Other uh, trading houses uh, who have you know, relatively similar structures of, uh, of shareholder ownership, but they don't have quite the same, same uh, problem in terms of uh, equity becoming debt on, uh, as, as uh, partners leave. And, in, and indeed, Glencore, after the financial crisis or in the midst of the financial crisis, did take steps to change that. Um, and the other one is that Glencore had been uh, very aggressively buying assets, uh, probably the most aggressively of all of the trading houses. Uh, and so that put them in a situation where they had a much greater need of long-term capital uh, than, than the rest of the industry. And so 
and so possibly no alternative but to go public. And the rest, the rest of the industry managed to find uh, different ways to raise capital. I mean, you know, the IPO is one route, but we have seen other companies, I'm thinking of the examples of uh, Beetle uh, partnering with, with um, sovereign wealth funds to, to invest in assets. So that was the, 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 the private equity and the sovereign wealth fund arriving into the commodity trading industry was a, a, a very important one. Temasek uh, became an investor in, in, in trading houses in Singapore. Um, uh, and we, we have had some sovereign wealth funds um, out of the Middle East also investing in um, or, or co-investing with trading houses, Modala of, uh, um, of, uh, of the United Arab Emirates, for example, alongside with, with Trafigura, another UAE entity now with, with Louis Dreyfus. And even in the case of, of, of Glencore, it's quite interesting that um, after the IPO today, his, his largest shareholder is a sovereign wealth fund from the Middle East. It's my impression, I might be wrong here, but those haven't exactly worked out that well, though, for the, the private equity groups and the sovereign wealth funds. No, I think that it has been a, a, it has been a, a, a bit difficult. I, I think that it has worked out for some of the co-investments, but also um, some of these sovereign wealth funds uh, in the Middle East and, and, you know, to your earlier question about uh, China and Kofco and so on, uh, profit and, and commercial success is not the only reason that they're investing in, 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 in commodities. I mean, a lot of the money that Kofco uh, has spent over the last uh, few years building that, that fantastic machine that is, is today probably is more related to security of supply of agricultural commodities into China rather than just a pure P&L play. And, and perhaps some of those sovereign wealth funds in, in the Middle East uh, that they are co-investing with the commodity traders. They really want the experience of being with a commodity trader because they they have a big exposure to the commodity market. So they want to learn something from them. And perhaps it's not just only about the PNL. Well, and you look at, for example, the, the investment of uh, ADQ, the Abu Dhabi uh, fund into Louis Dreyfus that was announced late last year and, and uh, is, is due to close uh, later this year. And they explicitly talk about food security as, as one of the reasons to, to make that investment. Yeah, I think that's going to be quite an important topic. And it's no longer just, just food. It's going to be about securing the metals, the resources needed for energy transition. Um, so we, we've been, it's been, in, you know, it's fair to say it's been in the doldrums for the last five years, let's say, or, or 2015, 14 through to 19 bottom of the super cycle in you know there's, there's been these sanctions banks pulling out um, you've once again had a hollowing out of talent um, very few in companies um, you know there's probably only two or three I would name that have really actually still invested in bringing new talent through and now we are at the the foothills if, if sort of the um, the zeitgeist is to be believed of a of a new commodity super cycle, this time not not necessarily driven by any particular country, but driven by the need for energy transition, tackle climate change. Um, you know, we've covered it a fair amount. Uh, you, you end the book talking about the challenges that these trading houses or commodity traders in general face and why perhaps the next super cycle isn't going to be the same you know, experience and gangbuster time that the last one was. It might that the last one might have been the last of of those kind of opportunities. Um, you, I know in the book you put it down to three things: talking about transparency um, in all of its facets, from compliance all the way through to, to pricing, um, sustainability. Um, you know, I don't want to steal your thunder, but can you just talk to what you think the challenges the the trading community faces as we look at the new. Um, the new potential super cycle. Let me let me start with a few of those, and 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 Jack can jump also. Um, I mean, I think that one is is information. Uh, today, uh, a lot more information is out there for anyone to have. We we're talking earlier that in the early days, uh, just the pri the information on on just where the market was, the price was was very important, and because not everyone had the same information. I mean, so. On, some, some miners were receiving um, the, 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 the prices via, um, you know, um, overseas or air mail that was taking days, if not weeks, to arrive to, to those miners. And, 
uh, and, and the traders were getting that information on, on uh, maybe the few telephone lines that were available on the, on, on the country. Now that has completely changed. Everyone knows what is the price of the commodities. Everyone has access to supply, demand, numbers, uh, meteorological information that previously was a huge advantage to agricultural traders that have their own uh, weather services uh, today are accessible to everyone. So I think that the traders have lost the monopoly of, 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 of the information and, and, and that is going to make their lives a, a bit more complicated. Uh, today, probably a hedge fund with a relatively small team of perhaps 10, 15 people can access the same kind of information that uh, the old trading houses of the 80s with you know hundreds of, of, of people on their desk will, will have. And I think that that's that's a significant change that um, will make the lives of the of the traders more complicated and it will make uh, profiting from uh, any increase in prices more difficult. This is the Internet of Things, containers with humidity you know, devices on them that are you know, beaming that information around the world. You know, in central Illinois, having tractors or farming equipment that has geolocation and crop yields data on flat screens in front of the farmer that he's also sharing or she's sharing with the with the hedge fund in New York, right? The the sheer scale of data produced and available means it's not only about capturing it, it's probably more about digesting it. And, you know, that's a, that's a different game in some ways. Yeah, to me, the, 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 the realization of that moment was on a trip to, to Ivory Coast a few years ago for a story on cocoa and, and going... Um, up north of uh, Yamasucro, the capital, um, into a small village, completely unannounced. Uh, uh, probably I have already got lost, so you know I, I was not really even sure where I was. And I arrive into this village, and I, you know, they are a producer. They have a small cooperative, and I'm talking to the to the farmers, and and then uh, as I usually do when I, I go anywhere, I always give my my business card because I think it's nice that you know people see who they have talked to and so on, and and then they. One of the gentlemen who is the head of the um, of the um, of the cooperative sees my my business card. I was at the Financial Times at, at that time, and 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 just basically rush into a small office, and and gets back with a piece of paper, and voila, it's a copy of one of uh, the articles of the Financial Times about the cocoa market that I have bylined with a colleague of mine. At that moment, you know, you are. <laughs> up in the middle of nowhere and, and you know, this this guy is reading your articles that you're writing from London. So you realize that even the small smaller cocoa farmer in the world has access to supply, demand and information of what's happening on the market. We've covered that a lot and I think that is a fundamental transformation. And the second one is that, and, and perhaps this is a slightly more speculative um, if it's fair to say, the, the last 20 years were characterized by free trade and you know it, from a talent perspective, the free passage of, of talent and so forth. That, you know, in the last four years has been a, a trend in reverse. You, you talk to that as a real potential threat to the to the commodity traders. You know, uh, what's the take there? I mean, I think it's not just a question of free trade. It's also a question of the, the volume of trade. You know, the last uh, 20 years, the growth of China has been a story of uh, trade uh, of all sorts growing dramatically but particularly trade of commodities. And uh, I think, you know, nobody can predict the future and certainly we can't either, uh, but uh, it's hard to see how you'll have the same kind of scale of growth in trade uh, in the coming 20 years that you've had in the past 20 years. Um, and so, you know, you combine that with things like uh, tariffs, things like uh, focus on origin of commodities, whether it's uh, fair trade coffee or whether it's uh, knowing where your cobalt or your copper comes from. Uh, that makes commodities less fungible. It makes them less easy to trade, you know, from one market to another because the price tells you that you need to send it to, to, to that place. Um, and so that probably, on balance, reduces the opportunities uh, for commodity traders. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there's also a lot of pro um, projects underway to try and start to, in a way, decommoditize commodities by giving them more attributes around, you know, where they're, they're where they're, the provenance, how they were mined, or whatever it might be. And that brings us nicely onto that. The real threat, in some ways, is ESG. Um, you know, the commodities industry, in particular, is at the it is at the center of of uh, environmental issues. 
you know, there's, and I, I think we should talk about it here as well. Talk about um, on the social and governance piece. You know, it's a very, is it, is, a, is a, it is not a diverse in terms of gender industry either. But that's the third kind of leg to the stool that you point to as a, a challenge to the commodity trading community. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we've been a bit surprised, I would say, by how many of the companies we've spoken to seem to still be on the back foot on several of those issues that you raised, uh, whether it's climate change and the future of, uh, of, of them, their industry, uh, if oil demand does decline dramatically if coal if it becomes impossible to trade coal because there's no financing for it. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that most people in the oil trading world don't see that happening imminently. Uh, possibly oil demand might peak, but that doesn't mean that oil is going to suddenly disappear and stop being uh, a huge and an important and valuable market for the world. Um, and so that probably drives some of the complacency, but I do think there is complacency there. Um, you know, you see what's happening uh, in with ESG in the kind of public capital markets and the way in which equity investors, increasingly banks, uh, are really focusing on uh, carbon intensity, uh, emissions, net zero, when they're looking at where to make their investments. How long is it before they start to ask that question of commodity traders as well, not just because you're Glencore and you mine coal, but also because you're Glencore and you trade coal, or because you're Beetle and you trade oil. Um, and I don't, yes, there are traders making investments and trying to push their businesses in directions that will benefit from, uh, from uh, the energy transition, trading and investing in cobalt and nickel and copper, or, or, or building up power trading teams and, and, and looking at emissions and that kind of thing. But uh, I'm not sure anyone has a good answer to what will replace the earnings of oil trading if oil trading stops being the, the earnings centre that it currently is. Power trading. Well, in the, renewable, in the energy transition future, power essentially goes to z price at zero um, from a variable cost standpoint because it's produced locally by you know, physical hardware on your roof or, or wherever. Um, that's a very different wallet size compared to what people have been used to in, in oil, you know, both production and trading. On the point that you were making earlier about diversity, I mean, I think that that is going to be a big challenge for the industry um, in the next few years. It's, um, I have actually been quite surprised uh, about going to the trading houses and, and really how few uh, women are working uh, there and how thin the pipeline is. And, and looking at the um, composition of the board of directors of management committees of some of the world's largest independent trading houses and, and see uh, a management committee of perhaps nine people and all male. Uh, sorry, it's 2021. Uh, this will not be happening. The industry makes Wall Street look progressive and, and, and almost left leaning. Commodity industry really needs to wake up to the problem and, and really accelerate change there. We have seen examples, have seen examples, particularly in big oil, on the, on the trading units of big oil, with uh, promotions of, uh, of women and, and very senior uh, women making it to, to very senior executive positions. But that remains so far the, the exception. And, and many of the companies that they are at the top of their commodity markets um, are and remain way behind, and I don't see a significant change coming from them. Yeah, which is a challenge, right? Because it's also um, it's then difficult to attract um, diversity into the industry, um, particularly if it's got these associated ESG issues. Not just the fact that you know diversity attracts diversity. Um, the and and I think it's been a one final point here is it's been a sort of common theme as well is that i think simon collins said on a previous episode that if if the external rate of innovation is is greater than the internal rate of innovation you're going to be overtaken and you know there are you know there the energy transition world of the future doesn't necessarily have to be owned by the existing and current commodity traders or, or energy producers you know there's significant um we talked about on this on this show 
um, threat of disruption, whether it's from the likes of the Teslas or the Fangs, you know, where, you know, they are uh, and, and they don't face the same issues around diversity and, um, you know, and don't have some of the historical assets and legacies that will need to be dealt with by these organizations. They did spend a lot of time investing in, in assets that might be worth less in the future, but also carry with them significant environmental liability. All that said, just, you know, to, 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 to conclude on that point, uh, I wouldn't be so quick to write, I mean, you know, Yes, the industry faces a lot of challenges, but I wouldn't be so quick to write off, uh, you know, the incumbent commodity traders. Uh, it's, an, it's an industry that has, you know, if anything, it has a history of being uh, nimble and flexible and, you know, changing and taking advantage of opportunities when they arise in a very, uh, in a very rapid way. Um, and so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see some significant changes in the industry that then allow it to take advantage of uh, whatever opportunities are coming uh, and you know you see that the for all that there are challenges to the model uh, it's still an extremely profitable one you look at 2020 uh, the world still provides opportunities for commodity traders there are times when supply and demand are out of whack or when uh, one market is booming and another one is collapsing uh, and somebody needs to move commodities uh, and, and in those moments in those extreme moments commodity traders make a lot of money and that's what they've done in the last year well, uh, yeah, that strikes me a couple of things. Firstly, energy transition is going to be characterised by ever more volatile energy markets, which have, will provide a huge opportunity to traders. But also the kind of the narrative of the book itself is is these individuals, these characters, this community of people who were incredibly entrepreneurial, incredibly um, quick-witted, um, intelligent, hardworking, you know, um, community that really created this industry. And, and, you know, um, reap some fabulous rewards. Um, so, yes, I think it would be uh, way, very much premature to start uh, to writing, writing any, any of these organizations off. Um, I, I really enjoyed the book. I think it was a fantastic read. I would urge any of our listeners to go and, go and buy a copy. Well, it's been, an, it's been a, a real pleasure having you both on. Uh, the World for Sale uh, is your book. It's available I assume, well, by the time this comes out, it's available all over the world in, in audio book as well as um, hardback um, on all ma- from all major retailers. And I would urge everyone to go and uh, pick up a copy. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us, Paul. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offerings as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.